This is winding down. We interrupt this series, that was on the atonement, to bring you an important message on how to bring your whole life under the blessing of God. This will wrap up this interruption on giving. I want to talk to you this morning about five eternal benefits of practicing the tithe, that means tenth, and beyond. And I feel a bit sorry. I was thinking about this last night. I feel a bit sorry for the person. You brought a friend to Cedarview today with the glowing endorsement that, you know, our pastor is not one of those guys that's always looking after your money. Recently, Christianity Today ran an article about millennials and Gen Xers in particular and financial giving. And in it, author James Williams of the Church of God World Service said some things that ought to be of concern, I think, to all of us in church today. Quote, Christian people 45 years old and younger have grown up mesmerized by the agenda of materialism. There's tremendous pressure on families to spend, spend, spend. And then he adds, the generation that used to believe in and practice tithing is in three places, retirement homes, nursing homes, or the cemetery. I didn't say that, so don't get mad at me. But in other words, he's saying that on the whole, with I'm sure great exceptions, generations following mine haven't embraced tithing. So in precise harmony with the world around them, in spite of what they say, what they say they believe about seeking God's kingdom first with all their heart, they see themselves and their families as the primary object of their spending and investing. And I'd like to argue this morning that if that's true, if that's true, then these generations are making a huge mistake. As I said in the first teaching in this series from the creation account, in Genesis. I, I think God still works through the tithing principle, even if it's no longer a legal work of law. And I want to give you five reasons from the scriptures why I think Christians should still practice the tithe, not as the ceiling, but as the floor, the tithe and beyond as his plan for advancing his kingdom, blessing our lives, reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Five thoughts. One, returning the tithe to the Lord's work honors the principle that as creator, God owns everything we have, including all our income. I've actually heard people object to the practice of tithing on the basis that everything that we have belongs to God. In other words, why should we press the issue of the tenth when everything we have, Pastor Don, everything I have belongs to God already, not just the tenth. Doesn't that make the practice of tithing seem kind of redundant or legalistic? No argument for me that everything we have belongs to the Lord, Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's. There's just a blanket statement. And you would think it wouldn't be necessary to add. If the earth is the Lord's, that covers just about everything. The earth, and then he says, all that it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. It's that phrase, all that it contains, that bites a little bit. I mean, I don't, I don't have a problem recognizing God created the heavens and the earth, like the Bible says, but, but that he really owns all that it contains, well, it gets really close to my wallet. This is as simple and straightforward as you can make it. If the whole earth is the Lord's, plus everything that is in it, then there's, is there anything left? The whole earth and all that it contains covers just about everything. 
There's nothing that doesn't belong to the Lord. But, but listen, that's not an argument against the specific act of tithing. It's an argument for it. This is why the old covenant law would call the failure to tithe, Malachi would call it robbing God. And I know, I don't live under the old covenant. I get that. But surely if everything belongs to the Lord, I should consider it an honor, a privilege, to return to him a portion of it. And that's exactly what the scriptures teach. My honoring the Lord with the tenth is my way of showing I understand the creation account in Genesis. This portion is not for your discretion. Dominion over the rest depends on honoring me in the portion that's not yours. That principle, I understand everything is his. You can see how this works even in human relationships. There's, there's something wrong with the husband who responds to his wife's complaint that he never spends any time with her. There's something wrong, thick-headed, about a husband that says, what do you mean? Everything I do is for you. Those words have a hollow ring to them if he never gives her any time that's specifically hers. Talking with her, giving her some evenings, taking her out on a date. Those, those are a way of showing that I understand my time is hers. Not just as a general concept, but as a practical concept reality. The special times you set aside, dedicated just to her, that's how you prove that she comes first in your heart and that all your time really does in fact belong to her. You have to demonstrate that. In the same way, tithing shows how deeply I believe that everything I have belongs to the Lord, that I am not a consumer. I'm a steward. All the difference in the world between those two terms. Here's the way I look at it. I'm talking about my life. You apply it to yours. I would rather do it differently, just apply it to you and not apply it to me, but apparently that's not a good system. Tithing shows with my wealth what the Lord's day shows with my time. My acknowledgement that all my life belongs to God, when I find it a chore just to come to his house consistently one day in seven, my claim that my life belongs to God is a crock. And my acknowledgement that all my wealth belongs to God, while I can't bring myself to part with a tenth of it, shows my life is just full of religious blither. Giving God a tenth of my wealth doesn't deny that all my wealth is his. It proves it. When I tithe, I prove that I understand all my wealth is his. It proves that I know the way I spend every cent says something about my view of God. What I do with every cent shows what God means to me in this world. Tithing is the constant offering of the first fruits. Point number two, tithing my total income to the Lord's work is an antidote. Here's the big point, the big point. I don't teach tithing as a law for Christians. I don't live under the old covenant. But tithing my total income to the Lord's work is an antidote to covetousness. This, this church this is as close to the living heart of discipleship as it gets. Wanting material things too much is suicide to my walk with Jesus. And he, this he, is Jesus. He said to them, take care. And he, and he can't stop. 
be on your guard. So take first take care and then be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now Paul, Colossians 3.5. How, how brutally do I have to deal with this? Well, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and that, which is that. Do you see this? Look at, I'm going to do this. See it right there? Same thing covetousness. Now the question we want to answer comes out of those first three words as they apply to covetousness where, let me clean this up. Is that doing anything behind me? Boy, I am so high tech. The words we want to look at for a minute are these. Put to death, therefore. So, I mean, there's some kind of a call to action, right? Put to death. That can't mean just mull this over a bit. There's some kind of call to action. We're not being told simply to ignore covetousness. That's for sure. It's not enough just to hope that this isn't going to ruin me like the Bible promises it will. Maybe I'll be able to dodge a bullet. We're not to just pretend it isn't in our hearts. In fact, the summons isn't even to come to an altar somewhere and pray for the removal of this desire. No, none of that is in the text. And just to brand the importance of heeding these words about covetousness, to, to keep us from hearing them the way... We don't want to hear these words the way everybody on the airplane listens when they're giving the instructions about what to do when the oxygen mask comes down and nobody's paying any attention. I don't want to hear these words like that. Surely there's more to it when he says, you got to put this to death. Don, you have to do this. Paul says something shocking about the danger of the peril of the covetous heart. Dawn, comma, you may be sure of this, bank on it. Everyone who is sexually immoral, agreed, or impure, agreed, or is covetousness. That is, remember we saw this before? An idolater. Anyone who, who, anybody who lets materialism govern his life, you're not getting into heaven. Has anybody told you that? If you live just to get more stuff, you're not going to heaven. And it bugs me that it starts off like that. Don, you may be sure of this. That's right. You can't get into heaven with a covetous heart. Paul is saying that my, my desire, I've got this and so do you, my desire for material things, it cannot just be left unchecked. It'll kill you and it'll keep you from eternal life. So, so it must be crushed, it must be put to death or I perish. And Paul is laboring to make me see that in that text. Like, it's very blunt. And so God, here's the good news of the gospel. God in his grace has made a provision for my big need. Tithing. God's great antidote to covetousness. It's God's primary means of freeing my soul from the chronic disease of wealth love. You have that disease. I have that disease. It comes from the fall. 
every time I tithe, here's why this works. Every time I tithe, I put a restraint on the desire of what I could have purchased for myself with that money. That's what tithing does. Tithing says, I could have, I could have done this. but I'm not because this is the Lord's. And in giving to the Lord, if all I see is a duty, I'm missing the point. God is seeing a vaccine against, that's not a good term to use anymore, is it? Everybody's, I just split the church in half. Okay, forget it. The medicine <laughs> against covetousness. That's what God's doing. It's not for him. God does not need money. I desperately need to put covetousness to death and sacrificial giving is the medicine. It's the cure. It's not the disease, it's the cure. And that's why also, as we saw last week, sacrifice is the measurement Jesus uses for New Testament giving, not the tithe. It's why tithing isn't mentioned very much in the New Testament. It is a couple of times, but it's in no way is it the standard of giving because tithing is not the ceiling. It's just the ground floor. It's where you start. It's the way it's supposed to be. It's the first step. The New Testament never intends tithing as the ceiling. It's the first step because tithing confronts covetousness to sacrifice is to not buy, and that's the idea. Tithing is one small step to recreating me into a steward instead of my natural inclination to be a consumer. It's easy to prove this truth. It's easy to prove this truth. Study 100 Christians who don't tithe, and you will soon see their reason. It's usually not that they've studied theology. It's not a hermeneutical issue. They will tell you they, I don't tithe because I'm not making ends meet now. Pastor Don, have you not noticed the price of gas? Where do you live? Interest rates are going up. I'm redoing my mortgage at a higher rate than I had before. So if I tithe, there's gonna be other financial commitments that, well, they're gonna be a stretch at best. So they don't tithe because, well, it affects lifestyle and they don't realize exactly. <laughs> See, that's the point. That's the point. Because the church wants people to tithe and people feel like they can't afford to tithe, a whole new approach has been dreamed up to deal with the non-tithers objection, a prosperity gospel. It's been birthed. It's really cool because it allows people to enter into the experience of giving without having to sacrifice anything. We've begun to tell people that they can have it both ways. They can actually use their tithes to make themselves rich and then they won't have to sacrifice. God will see to it. You put in a buck, you get 10 back. But the real tragedy here is that this new system, it negates, it skips over the greatest blessing of tithing. It turns giving into a means of feeding covetousness, not destroying it. The twisted prosperity gospel turns the solution to covetousness into the disease of covetousness. Tithing should cause personal sacrifice. If the level of my giving starting with the tithe doesn't cause me to do without anything, then I miss God's greatest work in my heart. I feed the disease that's gonna keep me out of heaven. This understanding, it just lies at the very core of scriptural giving. Every week, that crisis of not buying something for myself so I can give more to the Lord, that's absolutely essential to maintain that in my life. 
We must all confess. We must all fight covetousness every day we live and breathe. It's a poison to spiritual life. Tithing is the first step in an antidote to that poison. Tithing forces this question to surface in my heart. Do I value the cause and honor of God above all, or am I all talk? More in love with the 10% for myself. So God tests my heart with this. I've lived my whole life this way. God tests my whole heart every week with the tithe. He is out to kill covetousness in Don Horman with a vengeance. Killing covetousness frees the soul from the kingdom numbing deceitfulness of a covetous heart. So, so make, church, make this joyful discovery. There are two ways to contentment. Two ways to contentment. One works, one doesn't. Here's the one that doesn't work. The first way to contentment is to get enough things so your wants lack nothing. The problem with this inner deception is, I don't know if you've noticed it, but you never actually get there. You never actually get there. Covetousness is an insatiable, soul-numbing form of idolatry. The second way to contentment is to honor the Lord with sacrificial giving which causes you to scale down your wants and you find out that not wanting something is as good as possessing it. Your heart gets freed. Point number three. This is similar to the previous point, but I want to show you a little distinction. Point number three, when Christians learn to live by the tithe and beyond, it actually puts a governor on ever-increasing personal spending. It's very close to the last point, but it presses it a little bit deeper. It seems to be one of the most infallible rules of modern human life that spending expands to fulfill the income. I'm sure you've noticed it. If you make more, you'll spend more. And you'll observe something else, that spending begets more spending. That's because everything I buy, everything I buy has to be maintained, repaired, stored, replaced. You never get there. It's all, it's all part of what your New Testament prophetically called, in the words of Jesus, the deceitfulness of riches. John Paul Getty said, if you can count it, you're not a billionaire yet. How much do you need? I have a beautiful quote I want to read to you. I'm skipping ahead a little bit, you guys back there. From John Wesley, an amazing individual. Here's the quote. It's actually about John Wesley with a quote in it by John Wesley. John Wesley was one of the great evangelists of the 18th century, born in 1703. In 1731, he began to limit his expenses so that he would have more money to give to the poor. In the first year, remember how long ago this was, so these numbers, they don't register with us. In his first year, his income was 30 pounds and he found that he could live on 28, so he gave away two pounds. In the second year, his income doubled, but he held his expenses even so that he had 32 pounds to give away. That, by the way, is, is about an annual income. A comfortable year's income would be about 32 pounds then. In the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds and he gave away 62. In his long life, Wesley's income advanced to as high as, get this, he was a rich man, 1,400 pounds in a year, but he never let his expenses rise above 30 pounds. He said that he seldom had more than 100 pounds in his possession at any time. 
This so baffled the English tax commissioners that they investigated him in 1776, insisting that for a man of his income, he must have silver dishes that he was not paying excise tax on. He wrote them, I have two silver spoons at London and two at Bristol. That is all the plate that I have at present. I shall not buy any more while so many around me want for bread. When he died in 1791, at the age of 87, the only money mentioned in his will was the coins to be found in his pockets and dresser. Most of the 30,000 pounds he had earned in his life had simply been given away. It's the kind of thing we all, we, you're like me, we think, well, wasn't that nice for Mr. Wesley? <laughs> Get in the real world, man. And I get it. We hold up ideals like that, and they're pretty safe. But there is still somewhat of a principle. I mean, there's somewhat of a principle here. It is possible. It is possible. So you, you make whatever you make. Let's just pick round numbers. You're well paid. You make $100,000 a year. And then if, and, 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 and you live on, 90,000 and you tithe 10. The next year you make 200,000, if you did. Just because I make 200,000 doesn't mean I, I need to have a $200,000 lifestyle. I can make 200,000 and still keep the $100,000 lifestyle. In fact, I can make 900,000 and keep a $100,000 lifestyle. I know no one does that. I'm not saying that that's some kind of requirement. I'm simply saying that there is that principle that, that Everything becomes a necessity to a covetous heart. And everything that comes in can easily be spent, and we can justify the spending of it. And that's the thing that Paul says, Don, no one else is going to know except Jesus and the Holy Spirit. you got to kill that. Put to death that, Don. Put it to death. It'll keep you out of heaven. Point number four, living by the tithe and beyond will prove and strengthen your faith in the promises of God. Hebrews 13, five, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If you read those words quickly, you'll think they're about money. They aren't. They really aren't. They're about faith. And more specifically, they're about how to grow in faith. I mean, surely that's something that all Christians aspire to because, well, the writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God loves to see faith growing in my heart. So the question arises, Pastor Don, how can I grow in faith? Well, here's what I know for sure. If, if faith came simply by asking for it, we'd all be giants in faith. Of course, faith doesn't come just because we ask for it. Faith comes because, well, because I grow into it. It's a gradual process. And the writer of Hebrews says there's an absolute correlation between growing in faith in the promise and character of God and, and letting material things go that I think I need for my security, but really don't. So in other words, the strength and growth of your faith in God is proportionate to the way you release funds to the work of God's kingdom that we would normally think, I really have to have this. Point number five. This is the last one. The fifth reason for living by the tithe and beyond is it multiplies good deeds, bringing God greater glory. The point is this. Don't you love it when Paul starts like that? Whoever sows, he's talking about giving. Whoever sows sparingly, 
will reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly nor under compulsion. God loves a cheerful gift. That's why I've been laboring to say, I don't teach tithing on the basis of law. You've got to do I teach it as dealing with covetousness, growing in faith, discipleship, the joy. God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Bound in every good work. So at the end of verse 8, Paul says that when we sow generously and cheerfully, the result isn't just that we feel good about ourselves, though there is a joy in it. The result is there'll be an abundance of good works, good deeds. And notice the goal of those good deeds. The goal is, it's good deeds for the Lord. Excess money is for good deeds. Financial gain is for good deeds. Increased income is for good deeds. It's easy to get it all turned around in our heads. We can think, especially if we listen to the advertisers, that increased income is for increased spending. We can actually come to think that when God puts wealth into our hands, he's putting it there just for our pleasure. Paul says to the church of Corinth, Paul says, that's a huge mistake. That's a huge mistake. It misses the mind and heart of God, and the person who lives this way just doesn't know God at all. The wealth God puts into my hands is put there so the world will see God is truly glorious. The problem is, if the world looks at me, and in terms of how I use my money, if it doesn't see something it just can't make sense of, God will never be glorified. They won't see anything different about me. They'll see I can say the Lord's Prayer and I can sing worship choruses in church, but when it comes to like the real stuff of life, I'm just like everybody else. And Paul says, that's a disaster. That's a disaster. I, I have to ask myself, Don, do people think about eternity by the way you spend your money? Ask yourself, do people think about eternity by the way you spend your money? Or do they just think, wow, he's got, he's got cool stuff. What is there about the way I use my wealth that makes no sense to an atheist? What is there about my spending and giving that proves God is the most important thing in my heart? That's God's call to this church family. It's never changed. If I read Jesus right, as God's child on my way to heaven, I am simply the church does not think about this anymore. Unless Jesus was lying. As God's child on my way to heaven, I am simply not permitted to lay up treasure on earth. Do you remember where Jesus said that? Do not lay up treasure. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. Don't get confused. Don't anybody get confused. I pray that Christians make gobs of money. There's nothing wrong with making loads of money. It's not a sin to make lots and lots of money. I hope God blesses all sorts of people in this church. You get more money than you know what to do with because then you're going to know what to do with it. It is, it is not a sin to make lots of money. It is absolutely the sin of covetousness to just keep a lot of money. 
Did everybody hear the last part? It is absolutely a sin to just keep a lot of money. Did you hear the names of those passed away? You're next. Like we know it, don't we? We're all, we're all waiting for our flight. We're all at Terminal 1. Some flights leave at 7 a.m. Some flights leave at noon. Some flights leave at 4 o'clock. Some flights don't leave till midnight. We're all at Terminal 1. Every one of us. No one's getting out of here alive. Free your heart from covetousness and find the joy. So the series of giving is over. And everybody said, praise God. Yeah, I know. But the practice of purifying the heart, that's ongoing. So there's a kind of heart purification that we're okay with. Jesus, forgive me. I lost my temper. I think I might have told a lie. Uh, Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. There's another area of forgiveness that I've got this heart, Lord. I see it over and over again. It's inclined to covetousness. God, forgive me. Then sin created me a clean heart, oh God. All right, let's pray. Some sins don't go away just because we wish they would. There are sins that are cleansed automatically when we confess them. There are other sins, according to the New Testament, that have to be put to death. And giving is the way we put to death covetousness. We can't just say we're sorry for it. We have to kill it. Help us to see the joy, the light at the end of that process. Discovering God as our greatest delight and treasure. Keep that work ongoing in all of our hearts so it doesn't depend upon some slick fundraiser. It's an issue of discipling our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.